Welcome everybody to this session on moderation analysis. I'll be talking about how to use moderation in regression, a topic you might be familiar with, then how to apply it in structural equation models with a little bit of mediation sprinkled in. I'll be looking at how to compare nested models in LaFan, an issue on which we laid the foundations last week and which we will be revisiting today. And I will conclude with information about how to modify your models based on modification indices. Let's go. First, let's define moderation. And last week, we talked about different roles that a third variable can play. And one of those roles is as a moderator. Now, if we have a variable x and a variable y, and there is an unknown relationship between x and y, then the third variable z is a moderator which influences the relationship between x and y. In other words, the moderator affects the relationship between the two other variables. As an applied example, together with my colleagues Skylar Hoek, Regina van den Einde, and Tom Ter Bocht, we investigated whether being rejected leads to more problematic social media use amongst teenagers high in narcissism. The theory was that for narcissistic teens, being rejected feels like a personal attack for which they try to compensate by indulging in problematic social media use. And that hypothesis was inspired by the behavior of some high-profile public figures in recent years. So how do we study moderation? Well, for the reading this week, you were assigned the Barron and Kenny article, which describes four different cases and provide different ways of analyzing these cases. So the way Barron and Kenny discuss it, the first case is best analyzed using factorial ANOVA, two by two. The second case might be best investigated by testing the correlation for each level of the moderator. The third case might best be analyzed by including an interaction effect in multiple regression and the fourth case as well. However, I disagree with this approach, and I propose that you analyze all four of these types of cases just using basic techniques and structural equation modeling. First, let's examine the case where there's an interaction with a continuous moderator. Both x, y, and z are continuous in this example. Now, if you have a bivariate relationship between x and y, you know that you can represent this with a straight line. If you have two predictors in a multiple regression, then you can represent the effect of those two predictors as a flat surface in three-dimensional space. However, if we have a continuous moderator, the situation changes. The continuous moderator means that for every level of the moderator, the relationship between x and y can be different. So let's have a look at how that looks. Here's an app that I programmed to demonstrate multiple regression with or without an interaction term. Now, on the left, you see several controls. For example, I'm simulating data on 100 participants. My model has an intercept of 0 0.02, so that's the predicted value for people who score zero on both of the other predictors. Then there's a linear effect of x1 with a slope of 0.3, and a linear effect of x2 with a slope of 0.4. And there is an interaction term between x1 and x2, and I've set that to zero. So there is no interaction in this example. Another thing that I've set to zero is the residual standard deviation. That means that there is no residual prediction error, and you can see that indeed all of the observations are exactly on the regression line. There is no remaining prediction error. So if I rotate this graph, you will see that the regression estimates a flat surface. For every value of x1, the slope of x2 is exactly the same. So we get this flat surface through the data. You see? And if I examine that flat surface from one axis only, I see a linear effect of x2 on y. And if I rotate it 90 degrees, and I look sideways at the effect of x1 on y, we also see a linear effect. We can say that the marginal effects of x1 and x2 are linear and independent. Now, however, let's look at what happens when I allow x1 and x2 to interact. I will just add a small interaction term. So what we see is that by adding the interaction term, the surface relating these variables starts to curve. If I look at it from the side now, I no longer get this straight line. I get a curved surface, like a fan. And if I look at it 90 degrees from the other side, again, I get this rotating surface. And the reason is that because for every value of x1, 
the regression slope of x2 has a different value, and vice versa. So for every value of x2, also x1 has a slightly different regression slope. So an interaction effect means that the effect of x1 depends on the value of x2 that you're interested in. So if someone wants to know, hey, how big is the effect of x1, you would need to ask first, for which value of x2 would you like to know that answer? I recommend that everybody play around with this uh, demonstration. The link is in the slides. So how do we analyze the interaction with a continuous moderator in LaFan? Well, generally, it is good practice to center all predictors. And the reason for this is because multiple regression will tell you what is the effect of each predictor while keeping all other predictors constant at a value of zero. Now, if you don't center predictors, the value of zero might be meaningless and even fall outside of the range of observed data. If you center all of your predictors, then the value of zero is equal to the mean of that variable. Now, because we have an interaction in these models, the regression coefficients of an analysis with centered predictors will tell us what is the effect of the first predictor for the average value of the second predictor. And that is useful information. Then you can say, well, on average, the effect of x1 is this big. But of course, it differs if you look at higher values of x2 or lower values of x2. Now, to analyze a model with a continuous interaction, we have to calculate an interaction term. And an interaction term is a way to mathematically represent the fact that there's an interaction in our model. If our first predictor is called x and our moderator is called z, then we calculate the interaction term between x and z by multiplying the two variables. The syntax in R would be, for example, if we have an object called data, we can assign a new column called int by saying data dollar sign int, assignment operator data dollar sign x multiplied by data dollar sign z. This will create a new column in the data with the values of x multiplied by z. Now, to test this interaction term, we can estimate a regression model with both z and x and the interaction between x and z as predictors of the outcome. But there's a nice trick if you don't want to multiply variables by hand. And that trick is to use the function model matrix. The function model matrix can create all of the columns necessary to analyze a certain regression model. So for example, here I create an object called semdata, calling the function model matrix, and I give it a function predicted by x multiplied by z. So that means predicted by an interaction between x and z. And I want R to create the model matrix for the object called data. If we look at the resulting object, sem data, I see that I get four columns. I get one column with an intercept. The intercept has the value of one for every participant, as we discussed last week. Then I get a variable x, because x is required to analyze the effect of x multiplied by z. Then I get a column for the variable x, and a column for the variable z, and I get a new column of x multiplied by z. So this new data frame gives me all of the variables needed to analyze a model with an interaction between x and z. Because in R we typically don't have to include the intercept manually in our models, we can remove the first column from the data, as I've done in the syntax here. So the syntax here drops the first column from the data. Now let's look at an example where there is a binary moderator. So with a binary moderator, we have two groups and we expect that the regression coefficient is different between those two groups. This brings me back to the example that I mentioned earlier about narcissism and problematic smartphone use. We asked the research question, is the relationship between rejection and excessive smartphone use different for low versus high narcissists? So we had two groups for the variable narcissism. A different way to express this research question would be to say, does narcissism moderate the relationships between rejection and problematic smartphone use? And yet another way to ask this question is to ask, is there an interaction effect between 
narcissism and rejection. So in the diagram below you see what would happen if the relationship between X and Y depends on the value of narcissism. We see here that there's a low narcissism group which has a near zero slope for the effect of X on Y and we have a high narcissism group which has a positive effect of X on Y. So this is what an interaction with a dichotomous moderator would look like. Two separate regression lines. That is different from the continuous fan of lines that we saw in the example with the continuous moderator. With a continuous moderator there is also a unique slope for every value of the continuous moderator, but the continuous moderator can take any possible value. So it's a continuous gradient fan. So how would we analyze an interaction with a dichotomous moderator using regression? Well, we would first regress social media use on rejection, we would include a dummy for narcissism, and we would compute an interaction term for narcissism multiplied by rejection. You will often see that researchers use a hierarchical regression approach where they start with a model without the interaction term and then add the interaction term, and they test to see whether the interaction adds significantly to the explained variance using a hierarchical model comparison or an f-test for the difference in r squared. However, as I've emphasized in all lectures leading up to this point, it is better practice to base your analysis on theory. So if your theory suggests that there will be an interaction, as in this case our theory did, we predicted that narcissists would respond to rejection with more problematic social media use, if your theory predicts this interaction, just include the interaction in the model and then examine whether it is significant. You don't need to use this hierarchical model building. So let's look at some of the data that we could use to answer the question about narcissism and social media use. Here are the first few rows of the data frame called DF. We see that there's a variable called rejection, which represents how strongly rejected the participants felt. There's a factor variable called narcissist, which has the values high or low. And there's a variable called SM, which represents how much social media use these participants engaged in. So to analyze this research question using hierarchical regression, I could go through the following steps. First, I will create an object called ResMain, which stands for main effect results. And to it, I assign the results of a linear model using the LM function. And I specify a regression equation where I take the outcome variable SM and predict it from rejection plus narcissism. I take the data from the object called DF. Then I create a second output object called ResInt, short for results with the interaction. And to it, I assign the results of a linear model where I predict SM from rejection multiplied by narcissism. And again, I take the data from DF. Now in R, I can conduct hierarchical regression by asking for an ANOVA, an analysis of variance, comparing the model ResMain with the model ResInt. So these are nested models because I can go from the more complicated model with the interaction term to the simpler model with only the main effects by constraining the coefficient of the interaction term to be equal to zero. So I can compare these two nested models using an analysis of variance. And if I run that command, I get this analysis of variance table. I see that there were two models. The top one is the simpler one, the bottom one is the more complicated one. And I get a p-value for the model comparison. So here we see that the df, the degrees of freedom, for the difference between these two models is one. I have constrained one parameter to be equal to zero. And we see a sum of squares and an f-test and a p-value that belong to the difference in fit between these two models. I see that the p-value is non-significant, which means that the simpler model is not significantly worse fitting than the more complicated model. So I would prefer actually to keep the simpler model without the interaction term. Just to be sure, let's also have a look at the results of the different models. I can ask for a summary of the main effects model, and it will show me the coefficients of that model. Now what do I get? I get an intercept, I get a slope for rejection, and I get a slope for the dummy that codes for high narcissism. 
So I also know that the intercept represents the predicted value for low narcissists who score zero on rejection. I have not centered these predictors, so zero falls outside of the range of, of observed variables for rejection. I also see that the model has an R squared of about 0.21, so there's 21% explained variance, and the model is significant with a p-value of 0 0.004. If I look at the results for the model with the interaction term, I get four coefficients, again an intercept, an effect for rejection, an effect for the dummy that codes for high narcissism, and an interaction term between rejection and high narcissism. Now here's how we interpret these model coefficients. The intercept is the predicted value for social media use for low narcissists. The slope for rejection is the effect of rejection for again, the low narcissists. To get the predicted value of social media use for a high narcissist with a value of zero on rejection, I have to add the effect of the narcissist dummy to the intercept. So 2.23 minus 3.56, I will get around minus one and a quarter. That's a predicted value of social media use for a high narcissist with zero on rejection. And then to get the effect of rejection for a high narcissist, I have to take the effect of rejection, 0.5968, and then add the interaction term between rejection and the dummy for high narcissist, 0.6339. So those two added, it's about 1.2, they give me the effect of rejection for a high narcissist. Now this model has a R squared of 0.24, which is significant with a p-value of 0 0.006. But keep in mind that the ANOVA told me that this model was not significantly better than the model with only the main effects. And that is also reflected in the fact that the interaction term between rejection and narcissism has a non-significant p-value of 0.2113. Actually, looking at that p-value, it is exactly the same as the p-value for the ANOVA comparing these two models. So both the nested models test, the hierarchical regression test, and the significance of this interaction term give us the same information. Now it can be useful to inspect this interaction visually, and there is some syntax for that in this week's exercises as well. In this case, what I did is uh, I used the library ggplot2, plotting the object df, which is my data frame, I map the x-axis to the variable reject and the y-axis to the variable sm, and I map the color of my lines to the value of narcissist. Then I add several geometrical shapes. I add the geom point to represent individual data points. I add a geom smooth to get a smooth line, and I use the lm, linear regression method. And I add a theme, black and white, bw for short, to get a nice APA style graph. So here we see that indeed the interaction term is not very strong. Moreover, there's a restriction of range for rejection where the high narcissists tend to experience greater rejection. There's more of a spread in the low narcissists. So this method is very straightforward. Why would I not use regression all the time? Well, there are some reasons. And one is that it's more difficult for complicated models. For example, what if the indirect effect is moderated? A situation known as moderated mediation. Moreover, we cannot include a measurement model in regression analysis, so we can't use latent variables, so we cannot correct for measurement error of our constructs. And finally, we cannot test the fit of the entire model to the data in just one step. For all of these reasons, we need structural equation modeling. So here is one possible answer to this week's reading question. What are the alternatives to the different moderation models discussed by Barron and Kenny? One of these alternatives is structural equation modeling. And structural equation modeling has advantages because it is more simple to apply. All of the model parameters are estimated at once, so you don't have multiple testing issues. And complex relationships can be modeled in a more sophisticated way. So we can have moderated mediation, mediated moderation, etc. So how do we estimate moderation in structural equation modeling? Let's get into it. Before we do, however, I want to show you 
these two visualizations, which both represent an interaction effect between X and a moderator. In the literature, you will often see moderation represented as the graph on the left. So we see an effect of X on Y, and a moderator points directly to the arrow between X and Y. This drawing convention does not accurately represent the model that is actually estimated. The reason that people use this uh, the reason that people use this graphing convention is because it makes clear that our theory says that it is the effect of x on y that is influenced by the moderator, not the effect of the moderator on y that is influenced by x. This is an important distinction because mathematically the two are equivalent. To say that the effect of x on y is moderated by m is the same as saying that the effect of m on y is moderated by x. The two are symmetrical. Of course, our theories usually focus on moderation of a specific effect by another specific moderator. And that's why people tend to think, and that's why people like to use the graph on the left that really distinguishes which one is the main theoretical predictor x and which one is the moderator. What is really happening behind the scenes if we use the box diagram approach to graphing structural equation models is that there are three predictors, x, the moderator, and a new variable of x multiplied by the moderator. We've already encountered this when we created the interaction term by hand and used the lm function. The same applies to structural equation models. So now let me introduce the example we will use for the remainder of this lecture. We're going to look at a model that investigates whether adolescents' deviant behavior is a predictor for later criminal behavior. There are two theories. The one says that adoles adolescents' deviant behavior is specific to adolescents, and the second theory says that it generalizes to adulthood as well. And this model combines moderation and mediation. So here is our basic model. We have three initial predictors, education, motivation, and verbal ability, one measure of intelligence. Then we have a mediator, which is school achievement, and we have a final outcome, which is delinquency. Now imagine I bring another variable into the equation. What about adolescents' socioeconomic status? What role might it play in this model? Well, it depends on the research question. You might imagine, for example, that socioeconomic status could be just another predictor of delinquency. It might be correlated with intelligence, motivation, and education, but it just has a unique effect on delinquency. Or you could imagine that socioeconomic status doesn't influence delinquency directly. Instead, it limits adolescents' possible achievement and therefore has an indirect effect on delinquency. Or you could imagine that socioeconomic status is just a control variable, not correlated with education, motivation, or verbal ability. We just take out its influence in order to better, better estimate the effect of those other predictors. But there are also models that make less sense. For example, does it make sense to say that socioeconomic status is another mediator predicted by education, motivation, and verbal ability, and having an effect on delinquency? Now, if we collect correlational data, we could estimate this model. And if these variables are correlated, we could find significant mediation by socioeconomic status. But let's check the conditions for causal relationships to exist. The first of those is that there must be an association. Well, that could be the case in our data. The second is temporal precedence. So I ask you, which comes first? An adolescent's socioeconomic status or their level of education, motivation, and verbal ability? I would argue that the socioeconomic status is determined even before birth by the status of the parents and maybe by the neighborhood they live in, so it cannot be an outcome of education, motivation, and verbal ability. It must be a predictor. Or at very least, if we don't want to analyze the causal relationships between socioeconomic status and those other predictors, it must be on the same footing as those other predictors. So here's an example of classic moderation with these predictors. We could include socioeconomic status as just an additional predictor, 
And then we can look at an interaction between motivation and socioeconomic status as predictors of achievement. For example, you could imagine that if an adolescent has a low socioeconomic status, no matter how motivated they are, there are certain limits to their achievement. Whereas if an adolescent has a high socioeconomic status, their motivation might be encouraged and rewarded by their environment. So we could expect an interaction term between motivation and socioeconomic status. There is a different way to analyze this research question, however, and that is by investigating moderation as a multiple group model. So what is multiple group analysis in structural equation modeling? Well, in this case, the main question is whether the values of the model parameters are different across those two groups. And you can have different kinds of grouping variables. For example, biological sex, different nations, so you can do a cross-national comparison, rural versus urban participants, or different ethnic backgrounds. Multigroup structural equation modeling is often combined with the technique of comparing nested models, which we discussed last week. Now, here is how we specify a multigroup model in LaFan, and it's very easy to do. We just take our initial model, which is a syntax defined in the object called model, and then we call the LaFan function SEM, providing the model, the data, and a new argument, group equals. And here we can call the name of one of the variables in our data object. Any parameter can be constrained or freed across the groups. And for this, we use the same pre-multiplication syntax that I explained last week. So for example, here in the top line, I create a model, which is x predicted by y, and I pre-multiply y with a vector of two labels, C1 and C1. Now what this means is that I have two groups and I give this regression coefficient the label C1 in both of those groups. Now because those labels are the same, Lavan is going to estimate only one value for them. In other words, they're constrained to be equal across the groups. On the second line, I estimate the same model, but now I free the parameter across groups. So I pre-multiply it with two unique labels. And because these labels are unique, both of the groups have their own value for this regression coefficient. So I use the letter C here to represent the constraint coefficient. C1 is equal to C1. And I use the letter F here to refer to a free coefficient. So F1 is different than F2. There are also limitations to the multigroup approach. One limitation is that you can maybe obviously only use it when you have categorical moderators. You can have as many groups as you want, but a continuous moderator cannot be used to create groups. The second thing is that it quickly becomes complicated with more than two groups. You will have so many different parameter constraints, different labels for your different parameters, and so many potential comparisons to make, it becomes very complicated to do all the administration. So here's a cool application of the multi-group approach in LaFan, and hopefully this simple example will illustrate just how powerful structural equation modeling is. Perhaps you know that one of the assumptions of a t-test or of an ANOVA is that the outcome has equal variances in all of the groups that you are comparing. Now, if this assumption is violated with the traditional ANOVA or t-test, you just have to report that the assumption was violated and you don't really have any solutions. But if you use structural equation modeling, the solution is very simple. Compare these two models. The first model predicts y from some grouping variable. The second model predicts y from some grouping variable and then estimates the variance of y freely across the two groups. So you see the variance is labeled v1 in group 1 and v2 in group 2. So they are allowed to have different variances. And now we can make the comparison of the group means without assuming equal variances. So this is much more flexible than an off-the-shelf t-test or ANOVA. If we have a multiple group moderation for the more complicated model that I introduced before, we could have a model for low SES on the left and a model for high SES on the right. Now many of the paths might be hypothesized to be different for low versus high socioeconomic status individuals. Now in this model, I'm not primarily interested in the effect of socioeconomic status, but rather I hypothesize that the paths of these two models will be different for low versus high socioeconomic status individuals. 
So what I'm going to do in Lafan is to use labels to estimate different values for the coefficients for the low SES and the high SES group. In these diagrams, I will use the letter W to refer to low SES individuals and A to refer to high SES groups. And each of the paths will have a different number. So I have unique estimates for all of the coefficients for both of the groups. Here is what the model might look like. This is the model without the grouping variable. So I just specify the regression coefficients of achievement, education, motivation, and verbal on delinquency, and of education, motivation, and verbal on achievement. Here is what it looks like when I use the pre-multiplication syntax to give both of the groups unique labels for all of the parameters, thereby making sure that these coefficients are all freely estimated. So for example, the effect of the variable education on delinquency is labeled W2 for the low SES group and B2 for the high SES group. Now here I'm doing everything by hand. I'm labeling a lot of parameters, which is a lot of work. But there are also ways in Lafan to save you this work, namely to constrain whole groups of parameters at once. The default in Lafan is to estimate all parameters freely in each of the groups. But you can constrain a group of similar parameters all at once. And for that you use the argument group.equal. So imagine that I have a simple factor analysis. We've used this example before. I have three intelligence test subscales, visual, textual, and speed. Each of those are latent variables defined by three indicators. And I'm going to estimate a CFA for this model. Now I have a grouping variable, school, so the model is estimated freely across different schools, but I want group equal constraints for all of the factor loadings. What this means is that the factor loadings will be constrained across all of the different schools. You can constrain different groups of parameter estimates, and these are the different groups that are available. You can get the intercepts, the means of latent variables, the residuals of observed variables, residual covariances, latent variable variances, latent variable covariances, and regression coefficients. If you want to know more about these options, then you can go to the Lafan tutorial, which is very extensive and highly recommended. I'm sure you can find an example for your type of analysis in this tutorial. Now I mentioned before that if we are doing multi-group modeling, we are typically also interested in comparing nested models, where some parameters are constrained between groups or freed between groups. Now with this example, we are interested to know whether the regression coefficients are equal across groups. And for this, we could compare two nested models. Think back to last week when I explained when a model is nested. A model is nested when you can go from the more complicated model to a simpler model, by constraining some parameters to be equal to zero or equal to each other. And last week we constrained parameters to zero, thereby effectively removing them from the model. But this week we are constraining to be equal between the two groups of our multi-group model. Now when you do this, you can create different models and models can be distinguished by giving them different names. For example, I will often create an unconstrained model which freely estimates all of the parameters across groups. And then I will create a constraint model, which constrains some of the regression coefficients to be equal between the two groups. Now remember that I explained the logic of testing nested model comparisons in structural equation modeling last week, and I'll re recap it briefly. Imagine that we have a model one and a model two, and model two has one parameter less than model one. A nested model comparison will tell us whether this simplification by one parameter makes the distance between the model implied covariance matrix and the sample observed covariance matrix significantly larger. So we have to define the distance between the observed sample covariance matrix and a model implied matrix. If this distance becomes significantly larger after removing one parameter, then we conclude that model two fits significantly worse. So the steps are, is the distance larger? If so, then we get a larger chi-square test value. If the chi-square test value becomes so large that it becomes significant, then we conclude that model two is significantly worse, and therefore we have a preference for model one. 
However, if the chi-square difference is not significant, then we are left with model 2 which is simpler and not significantly worse than model 1, and therefore we have a preference for model 2. So in Lavan, we could apply these nested model comparisons as follows. First, I will create the model with all of the regression coefficients as I specified them before. Then I create an object M3, which contains a model with three parameters across both of the groups. I call the function SEM with the model, the data, and a grouping variable SES. Then I create a second model called MFIX, where FIX is short for fixed parameters. I again use the same model, the same data, the same grouping variable, but this time I add the argument group.equal regressions. That tells Lavan to constrain all of the regression coefficients between the two SES groups. And then I have two options. I can use that same function ANOVA that I used with the simple LM regression to compare these two models. So I can use ANOVA to compare the fit of M3 and MFIX. Or I can use a function from the library SEMTOOLS which gives a more detailed comparison of the two models, but it works the same. The only thing is that when I call the function compareFit, I have to give a name to the two models again. So I can say free equals m free and fix equals m fix. If you don't name these two models, then the function will give an error. So which parameters do we want to constrain? When we're doing path analysis, like in this example, where we only have observed variables, Typically, we're only interested in comparing regression coefficients across the groups. But we can constrain any other parameter that we are interested in to be equal across groups. If you think back to the example of the ANOVA with unequal variances across groups, you know this to be true. But I can also allow covariances to be free or constrained across groups, etc. It is important to note that some of these constraints may be unlikely from a theoretical point of view, and we should really be using all of these tools to accurately represent the assumptions inherent in our theory. Other constraints might represent reasonable theoretical assumptions, for example, that a measurement model is the same across different schools. So how do you go about the process of constraining? Well, first you can start with an unconstrained model where every parameter is free between the two groups. Then you could constrain paths that you theoretically expect to be equal across the groups. And a third step, you would compare the model fits to see whether the constrained model is significantly worse than the unconstrained model. And what is your conclusion if the fit is significantly worse? Well, your conclusion is that these constraints are not justified because they make the fit of the model significantly worse. A different way to go about it is to start actually with a constrained model where every parameter is fixed between the two groups. And then you can free up those few paths that you expect from theoretical reasons to be different between the two groups. Then you again compare the model fit and check whether the constraint model is significantly worse. Now, if the constraint model is significantly worse in this case, then you conclude that those free parameters are necessary in order to fit the data adequately. When reading the literature, you might run into what is called the stepwise approach, where people constrain paths one by one until the model fit is really good. But this is a risky proposition, because you're running many repeated tests and you're conducting exploratory analysis, adapting your modeling decisions based on the significance of your results. And what typically ends up happening is that you end up overfitting noise in your data. That means that you free a parameter even though the observed differences between the groups are simply due to chance. The best solution to this problem is to not use a stepwise approach. Instead, make theory-driven decisions. Before you even collect your data, list the different models that you want to estimate and compare with one another, and only stick to those models and comparisons. If you must engage in data-driven exploration, a different solution is to use fit indices with a penalty for the number of parameters. So instead of looking at the significance of model comparisons, use fit indices that penalize the number of parameters in your model. And this brings me to the final topic of today's lecture, 
the issue of modifying models. This course is focused heavily on theoretical model fitting, where we are trying to translate a theoretical model into a statistical model. But sometimes the model isn't correct, and we notice that from the poor model fit. What do we do in such a case? Well, we might turn to more exploratory analyses, and this is where modifying models comes into play. Imagine my surprise when I worked together with a coronavirus researcher who had provided a very well-researched theoretical model and some data, and I thought my task was as simple as fitting the model to the data. But when I did, the fit was completely unacceptable. What do you do? The theory was well substantiated, but the fit was not good. Well, in this case, you might turn to modification indices. And before I explain in more detail, a modification index simply tells you which parameters would most improve the model fit if you added them. So for example, modification index might tell you that you should add an extra parameter, maybe a factor loading here or a regression coefficient here or a covariance here. So which of these parameters should be added is suggested by the modification index, sometimes known as a Lagrange multiplier test. In my specific situation, the problem was that we had a theoretical mediation model, but we had both of us forgotten to include the direct effects from the initial predictors to the ultimate outcome. We had only specified the indirect effects, but after thinking about it again, it made perfect sense that there should also be direct effects. So to understand modification indices, I would like to take you back to one of the early le earlier lectures where I discussed the difference between the observed covariance matrix and the model implied covariance matrix. So there will be differences between the observed and the model implied covariance matrix, and modification indices focus on the biggest of these differences. So for example, here on the left, you see the observed covariances, and on the right, you see the model implied covariances. And we see that there is a relatively large discrepancy between the covariance of lozenges with word mean and lozenges with word mean in the model implied covariance matrix. For each of the constraint parameters in our model, including all of the omitted paths, because remember you can omit a path by constraining it to be equal to zero, we can obtain a modification index by taking the estimated chi-square decrease if this constraint were released. So if we were to release one constraint, that's the same as adding one path to the model, then our chi-square will decrease, indicating a better fit or less misfit between the observed and the model implied covariance matrix. We can use rules of thumb, such as that we would like to see a chi-square decrease of at least 3.84, and if the modification index exceeds this value, we decide to include that path. So how do we get modification indices in Lavan? Well, for each non-free parameter, so each parameter that is constrained to be equal to zero or constrained to another one, we can get modification indices by specifying the argument mod indices equals true, or we can use the function mod indices and run it on the results of our analysis. Then we get this table, and in the table you see all of these coefficients. So for example, here are the factor loadings of x4, 5, 6, and 7 on the latent variable visual and we get a value mi, short for modification index. Now we already see that the modification index for the effect of the latent variable visual on x7 is very high, it's 18.6. So this loading really wants to be estimated. We call this a cross-loading, so a variable from one latent factor that wants to load on another latent factor. Now our cutoff, as I already mentioned, is 3.84, that is based on a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom and an alpha of 0.05. But in practice, what researchers tend to do is to sort this table of modification indices by sign of the index. So we get the biggest modification indices first and then lower as we go down. Then you want to focus on the biggest modification indices first. You might also ask yourself, did I make a mistake? such as my own mistake in forgetting to include the direct effects from my initial predictors to the eventual outcome. Ultimately, you might have to strike a balance between theory and pragmatism. Obviously, you want a model that represents your theory as well as possible, but you have to be pragmatic in the sense that if your fit is unacceptable, you either forgot some important paths, or the theory is just not true, or maybe the data quality is very poor.
I do want to leave you with one warning before we conclude this course. And that is, be careful with modification indices, because this is an exploratory analysis technique, not a theory-driven technique. So don't blindly follow the modification indices. Make your decisions based on theory. And also, for example, don't estimate causal paths that go against the flow of time. For example, something predicting socioeconomic status. After you make enough modifications, your model will always fit, but it will be very complex and it's likely to replicate poorly to new data sets. And that is the problem of overfitting noise in the data. The best way to avoid this problem is by focusing on theory and translating your theory to a statistical model. With that, we conclude this lecture and good luck with the final practicals.